Good morning. Good morning. I can hear myself. As was mentioned earlier today, it's deemed Sunday School Sunday or the kickoff of the Sunday School year. You know, Sunday School originated in England. That's where it began. Children there worked alongside their parents in the mills and, and factories six days a week up to 13 hours a day. So they only had Sundays off. The problem was they were running all over the place, tearing the place up, getting into trouble, getting arrested, destroying people's property, stealing, all kinds of stuff that people started complaining about. In 1751, first Sunday school opened at St. Mary's Church in Nottingham. Another early start was made by Hannah Ball, a native of, of uh, High Wickenby in, in uh, Buckinghamshire in 1769. However, the pioneer of Sunday School is commonly, though wrongfully said, is Robert Rake, probably who you've heard the most about. But the Sunday School isn't what it was today. You know, he was the editor of the Gloucester Journal, and after seeing these young people run around tearing things up and the plight in the Gloucester slums, the first Sunday School was begun in the home of Mrs. Merritt. The Sunday schools were basically just that, schools. Rich wrote an article in his journal about the need for education for the youth. And as a result, many clergymen supported the schools, which were aimed to teach the youth things like reading, writing, ciphering, and knowledge of the Bible. In fact, the only textbook most of these Sunday schools had was the Bible. It was in 1781 that William King, a friend of Rake's, promoted or prompted him to start a Sunday school. After all, he'd already had one started in Dursley. So in, by 1785, 250,000 English children were attending Sunday school. And the role of Sunday school changed due to the Education Act of 1870 and a few more after that that came out in Parliament. And this made it mandatory for children to attend at school ages of 5 through 13, and actually created a separate education from religious education. The idea of American Sunday school systems begun by Samuel Slater in the 1790s in his textile mills in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. The Sunday schools were held in the afternoon and staffed by various denominations. It wasn't beginning until the 1930s that the transition was made from the afternoon to Sunday morning. For Sunday school. So needless to say, Sunday school has gone through quite an evolution since its inception over 230 years ago, moving from academic to religious instruction running side by side to what we see today as what we call Sunday school. It is basically a generic name for many different types of religious education pursued and conducted on Sundays by various denominations. So there's been quite a change over this. But the role of Sunday school has played a very important role in our society and the witnessing of God's word to young and old alike for the last 230 plus years. In fact, some of our memories, as I indicated earlier, have been in the Sunday school class. We were just wee little grasshopper knee hopper kids. You know, either brought by our parents or our grandparents or maybe a friend. It was the witness of those teachers from our early childhood that helped us develop and begin shaping our beliefs and understanding of God's saving grace and mercy. In fact, our foundational understanding of what Christ has done for us in his life, death, and resurrection. Most of us remember learning little songs like, how many of you, one of the first songs you learned was, This Little Light of Mine. I remember that one. Sunday school. And the biggest one, Jesus Loves Me. I remember that one. Mm. We learned that in our younger years. They still stick with How many remember maybe your first Sunday school teacher? Anybody? Yeah, remember what they taught you and what they were like? You know, a picture is worth a, a thousand words. So let me try to paint a picture for you this morning. In fact, better off, you paint the picture while I tell you the story. There's this 83 year old grandmother standing in the checkout line at the Kmart store. She chats with this young boy standing in front of her. He was very proud of the $5.98 watch that he just purchased. And somewhere in their friendly conversation, 
She asked the boy where he goes to Sunday school. He says, I don't go. And she goes, really? I think you'd like it. Could I call your mother and ask her if I could pick you up? We have a choir, too. The kids have a lot of fun. So every Sunday, this 83-year-old woman picks up this 10-year-old James for Sunday school. The mother of the children wants to come to the children's choir concert. There's no father in the family. But all get to Sunday school and church in 1973 Pontiac, along with his 83-year-old grandmother. Soon contacts are made with introductions, and the mother and family find a church home. All because of this 83-year-old grandmother who witnesses to him. Meanwhile, this 83-year-old grandmother is back at Kmart at the pharmacy on her walks around her apartment responding to God, to what Jesus has said. His words at which we look today is the last spoke to his followers before his ascension. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. You shall be my witnesses. Not just the pastor. You shall be my witnesses. I said a couple weeks ago that you want a pastor to go out and contact people and bring the members in. So if pastor's doing that, what are you doing? Then say here, let's see, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's from Acts 1.8. Did anybody hear the word just pastor in there? Anybody hear that? I didn't. It means something for all of us to do. That's what Jesus said. You shall be my witnesses. And that's what that 83-year-old grandmother was doing in Southern Illinois. We hang on to the last words of our loved ones and friends. And we should. A mother still bearing the pain of her daughter's death shared her anguish over her grandchildren, her grandchildren. Her deceased daughter with two girls, with great feeling and with freshness of, of the recent death event, she told what had happened when her daughter was dying. She took her mother's hand and said to Ernest Pathos, you'll take care of my daughters. And the mother responded, of course I will. And the mother's grandmother was hanging on to that word, take care of my daughter. This grandmother wanted desperately to follow the last words of her daughter. We hang on to the last words of loved ones and friends, and certainly we should hang on to these last words of Jesus also. His ultimate command to you and us is to, you shall be my witnesses. The witness is the calling of every Christian. It isn't that the message is garbled. It's very clear. There's no problem communication here in what Jesus said. In fact, there's a funny story about a rather proper lady who said to the clerk of the library, I'd like to have a nice book to look at over the weekend. The library said, well, here's one about a cardinal. And she said, I'm not interested in religion. <laughs> the library says, oh, but the cardinal's a bird. Which lady responds, I'm not interested in his private life. <laughs> There's no problem of communication. You shall be my witnesses. It's as straightforward as that. So nail it down. The witness is a calling of every Christian. Because how many of you remember Billy Graham? I know the name Billy Graham. How many know the name Billy Graham? You see, you all hands know it. <coughs> All right, how many of you know the name J. Wilbur Chapman? Hmm. Nobody remembers that name, do you? I don't see many hands this time. Well, listen to this. A Sunday school teacher, Mr. Kimball, whose name was only remembered in forgotten books, met a Boston shoe clerk named Dwight L. Moody 
to give his life to Christian or to Christ in 1858. While preaching in 1879, Moody lit a fire of evangelistic zeal in the heart of a pastor of a small church. That pastor was Frederick B. Meyer. That name ring a bell? Well, F. B. Meyer became one of the greatest preachers in the world. He was preaching on the American college campus and was instructed in bringing Christ to a student named J. Wilbur Chapman. First new name you guys been recognized. Well, Chapman engaged in the YMCA work and was used to reach a professional baseball player named Billy Sunday. That ring a bell, please? Yes. One of Billy Sunday's great revivals took him to Charlotte, North Carolina. So businessmen of that city were so excited about it, they planned a second campaign and invited an evangelistic an evangelist named Mordecai Ham to lead it. Is that name ring a bell? I didn't think you know his name either. But during the Ham revival meeting, a young man named Billy Graham heard the gospel and yielded his life to Christ. Only eternity is going to reveal a tremendous impact that one Sunday school teacher, Mr. Kimball, who led the White L. Moody to give his life to Christ in 1858. Jesus anticipated that. That's the reason he said, You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and in the uttermost parts of the earth. The witness is a calling of every Christian. To fulfill our calling to witness, we have to have something to share. Is there anyone here old enough to remember drummers? Well, I didn't think so. They were salesmen who traveled door to door through rural areas as well as the small towns. Drummers were given that name because they were people who sold merchandise from covered wagons. None of you looked old enough to remember that. They traveled across the country. They were called drummers because most of them would pull into a small town and beat a drum or pans together until they had an audience. And most of the residents knew that a rolling department store had come to town when they heard that sound. Drummers used to use an expression between themselves that you can't do business out of an empty way. And you can't. It's a very lucid metaphor. You have to have an inventory of products if you're going to make a sale. You can't do business. And you're calling the witness out of empty way. You have to have something to share. It's very simple. You must know the Christ to whom we witness. It's kind of like my coloring book. You know? If you don't know him, you can't say anything about him, can you? You have to know him. Very simple. We can't share with another what we don't know. Any more that we can come back from where we've not been. Human friendship gives us a cue. We like to talk about the friends that we know and love. We like to introduce them to our friends. And the more we know and the more we love them, the free we are to entertain and to spontaneously introduce them to other people. Because we're wanting to share as much as we can about the joy of our relationship. You should get the point. To fulfill our calling to witness, we must have something to share. We must be comfortable in our relationship with Jesus. We must know Him personally. Our relationship to him must be a making, must be making a difference in our own lives personally, to be able to witness to somebody else. And that's a whole notion, being comfortable and sharing and raising issues of that are reservations about our witnessing. Sometimes we, we just don't do that. We're afraid to do that. In fact, there's two common reservations about witnessing. First reservation is this. Some of us are very hesitant to talk about 
hallowed things. But Paul Emily uh, uh, Dickinson thought we should rightly be hesitant, so she wrote, People talk of hallowed things aloud and embarrass my doll. Is that we are embarrassed about the deep things of our life. We're shy to share them. It was because we think hallowed things are too private and personal. But whatever the reason, we, we really need to deal with it because one of the great barriers to the Christian enterprise of witnessing is our reluctance to talk about our relationship with God to other people. I really believe that people do want to talk about God. It's there. They want to do it. And once that silence is broken, once that superficial barrier is penetrated, people want to talk about things that matter. Their deep feelings and yearnings about love, about death, you know, about purpose of life, and where life is headed. Experts who study these things tell us that the most of our conversations consist of what they call middle language. It's safely superficial and jocular. Which we keep disconnected from how we really feel about our serious thoughts. In fact, David Igato, the poet, described it in this poetic dialogue. I have something to tell you. I'm listening. I'm dying. Oh, I'm sorry to hear. I'm growing old. It's terrible, I've heard. It is. I thought you should know. Of course, I'm sorry. Keep in touch. I will, and you too. And let me know what's new. Certainly, though it can't be much. And stay well, and you too. And go slow, and you too. So we talk about a high price of lettuce, the playoffs, the Super Bowl, our fantasy football teams, our diet, the stock market, the weather, trivia of, of our work, Taxes, the best car to buy in town, our aches and pains, our vacation plans, and movies we see, but nothing really important. Every survey of people's conversations find that these concerns and others like them dominate our verbal exchange and our sharing with others. And only rarely do people speak of hollow things in their lives. And that's a tragedy. And that's the reason that many people never engage each other in real communication. They're hesitant to talk about hallowed things. Sheldon Van Aken wrote a marvelous book about his struggle with his faith and his, his conversion. He was influenced by C.S. Lewis. After he could become a Christian, he wrote this confession. He says, I was a Christian. I, who had always regarded Christians with uh, pity and disdain, must now convince to be one. I did so with shrinking pride and a curious mixture of emotions. Part of it was my not wanting my sophisticated friends and fellow academicians to know I was half inclined to conceal my faith and to tell no one. And yet it seemed that if I were to take a stand for Christ as my Lord, I had to tell others. We must overcome our hesitancy to talk about hallowed things. The second reservation that we have about witnessing stems from our feeling that we don't have anything to share. The late Red, comedian Red Skelton, how many remember Red Skelton? I love that man. He told a story about himself that happened in earlier years of show business. He said that a young man at the time had a secretary on his staff that had done a lot of extra work for him. And so he decides that he would like to give her a gift to show her his appreciation. So he asked his wife what she thought would be an appropriate gift. And so she thought for a moment, and she says, well, why don't you just get her some perfume? That would be good. He said, but I wouldn't know what kind of perfume to get her. And his wife replied, well, why don't you just tell her that you want to give her this gift and ask her what kind she likes. And so that's what he did. Well, when he asked her, the secretary said, oh, Mr. Skelton, I just love working for you not to give me a thing. You don't need to buy me a gift. But of course, he persisted. And so finally, she says, well, if you insist, my favorite perfume is called 
Romantic thoughts at, moon, at uh, midnight. Romantic thoughts at midnight. So the next day, Rich got went to an apartment store. He walks up the perfume counter, and an elderly saleswoman is standing there and asks if she could help. And Red Scout says, What? Well, yes, you can. Do you have romantic thoughts at midnight? <laughs> Says one just kind of stood there and looked at him and said, Listen, Sonny, I had to drink coffee just to be able to stay up and watch 10 o'clock news. <laughs> it's a funny story, but it illustrates the point. We sometimes feel that we don't have anything to share. And we make it clear that feeling comfortable at our relationship with Christ does not mean that we feel we have a lot of the answers. That's not what it's saying. It doesn't mean that, that there are not questions that we, that we have about our faith. It doesn't mean that we don't wake up maybe at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning wondering sometimes where we are in our relationship with God and begin to question God about all that He's doing in our life. It doesn't mean that we always are bubbling over with joy because we're filled with the Holy Spirit. But what it does mean is that we are honestly seeking a cultivated relationship with Christ. We have trusted Him with our salvation. And we're certain that it's only His grace that provides salvation. And it means that we are open, that we are vulnerable, willing to confess that we are not, or we are pilgrims on the road, not yet made whole. We're still under construction. But we're trusting Him to complete the work that He has begun within us. That's all we're doing. If we can have that kind of an attitude, that kind of a stance about the faith that we're pilgrims, growing, struggling to incorporate the, the life of Christ in our life, it'll always have something to offer somebody else. Let's resort was a sophisticated Georgia newspaper columnist who pretended to be a redneck. Sometimes he offended people, often deliberately. And some didn't like the way he'd brag about being married three times. But he had a way of sharing life in a fresh fashion and getting at the heart of the meaning of life. In fact, in one of his columns, he had this to say. On a cold day last week, I stood outside the church of my hometown Moreland, Georgia, that is so dear to my childhood, and tried to remember how long it had been since I was inside. Ten years? At least that long. But if there weren't still roots here, would I come back so often in my mind? Church is about all we had then. Sunday school was at 10, but preaching was only twice a month since we shared sermons and the preacher with another flock down the road, he said. And what they called Sunday night, MYF. We had a couple of rowdy brothers in town who broke into a store. They were juvenile offenders. They were punished and had to attend a Methodist Youth Fellowship for six months. As I'm trying that today. First night they were there, they beat up on two boys, threw a hymn on the lady who met with us and always brought cookies. She ducked in time, he says, and then looked at them squarely in her devilish eyes. As soft as the angel she was, she said, I don't approve of what you boys did here tonight. And neither does Jesus. But if he can forgive you, so can I. And she handed the entire plate of cookies. And the last I heard, both are good daddies with steady jobs and rarely miss a Sunday in church. That was the first miracle I ever saw, he said. That woman provides the model. We don't have to worry about not having something to share. If we love Jesus, and he is making a difference in our lives each day, if we care for others and believe Jesus can make a difference in, our, in their lives, 
that we can share our love and concern, and in doing so, share Jesus with other people. If we're going to pay attention to what Jesus said, and fulfill our calling to be witnesses, we must have a passion for souls, and a plan for our witnesses. A passion and a plan. Unless we care enough to be deliberate and intentional, we're not going to be effective and fruitful witnesses. So the question this morning is, do you believe that Jesus has made a difference in your life? Do you believe he can make a difference in your friend or neighbor's life? Do you believe that whether a person accepts Christ as Savior determines how and where they will spend eternity? If you believe all that, you'll have a passion and a plan. And you'll be deliberate and intentional 